All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining for our 2032 conversation series. Um, we do these every Saturday, so we hope you'll continue to join us. And we're super excited that this week we are launching Earth Week with a discussion on sustainability and climate change. And uh, we have an awesome group this week, uh, which we'll introduce in a minute. I'm Christy. I am the founder of a company called Ruse, and I that creates immersive and interactive entertainment where you don't just see the story, you live it. And I'm co-producing Resilience with Noor. Thank you. Um, thanks, Christy. Yes, and uh, for those of you that know that don't know me, my name is Noor, and um, I created uh, Disruptivist, where we are growing a collective of artists as activists um, around the world with a mission to amplify the power of the arts for social change. And um, together, Disruptivist and Roos are co-producing Resilience 2032. And Resilience, uh, for those of you that are joining for the first time, because I see so many new names, um, so thank you for being with us today. Uh, Resilience is an alternate reality experience that takes place in the year 2032, in the future, uh, 12 years from now, uh, centered on a US presidential election. The year 2032 also happens to be two years after the sustainable, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are meant to be due. Um, and uh, we have uh, centered our story world on three main pillars, um, climate change, the future of data ethics and technology, and um, systemic inequality and looking at how inequality um, uh, intersects uh, all of these important um, pillars. Yeah. So the format of the experience is what we're calling social media theater uh, because it is inherently interactive and it unfolds in real time. So the story will unfold across multiple platforms from Twitter to Facebook to Zoom calls to um, TikTok. And the thing that's really unique about it is that the participants are invited to create their own content and become an active role in the story. And you are all invited to join us. So uh, we just launched our story world about a week ago with um, some conversations with a, an in-story group called Disquisitive. Um, and those are Zoom calls that will be published as podcasts very soon. And we are working on continuing to build the story world. Our original timeline, we weren't supposed to launch the fiction until August, but given our current circumstances with everyone inside, we are accelerating our timeline so that we can um, start to actively imagine our future together now and not wait until August. Yes, and this is part of what we decided to kick off as our research series, the 2032 conversation. So as we, the creative team, were trying to decide on some of the, this, the main um, uh, the uh, the main pillars. I'm seeing so many friends. This is so great. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> um, so as we were the creative team deciding what do we want our 2032 future um, to look like or what kind of um, story points do we want to uh, um, finalize, we realized we needed to talk to experts and thought leaders and futurists about what they think um, the next 12 years are going to look like, specifically through the lens of climate change, the future of data and technology and systemic inequality. And so we kicked off a, um, our 2032 conversations a few months ago in New York before COVID times, uh, where we looked at the year 2032 through the lens of climate change. Um, and uh, in that um, conversation, we did tease, like we mentioned uh, the future of pandemics uh, due to climate. Uh, we talked about the future of pandemics and the possibility of it and it being um, specifically uh, a, like a dystopic future we didn't want to go there in our story world with. But here we are two months later living a global pandemic and living uh, the future that we feared um, in one of our conversations. So we decided to continue to host these conversations virtually. So they're happening every Saturday. Um, last week we talked about the future of disinformation and the future of um, uh, journalism because uh, polarization is such a strong theme in our resilience um, project. And uh, 
uh, some, for those of you that were with us uh, in previous weeks, the second hour is where we have a creative exercise, and this is something we did when we were having our events in person as well. Um, our creative exercise includes us all collectively prototyping um, our future. So with that, I will um, let you know that with resilience, we, are, we believe in futures thinking, um, storytelling, and futures thinking, and what uh, speculative design and thinking is are, is a core to this project and to um, what uh, we are trying to achieve with our alternate reality experience. Um, so yes, we have a future thinking deficiency, but studies have shown that 53% of Americans say they rarely or never think about the far future. 21% 20, report imagining the future less than once a year. 32 say it never crosses their mind at all. Um, studies have shown that people who don't think about future the future, vote less often, save less for retirement, make poor health decisions, procrastinate more, harder time resisting temptation, care less about long-term challenges like climate change, and are more likely to drop out of um, school or be arrested and much more. There's not enough research that is being done about um, futures thinking. We hope to change that with this project, but um, uh, it is, yes, very difficult to sometimes, especially when we're dealing with um, uh, circumstances like the ones we are right now, um, on, a, on a global level, this global shared experience, um, we believe that global level futures thinking is important now more than ever. And um, thinking through the lens of possibilities for the future, yes, is difficult. Um, um, the Marshall McLuhan, uh, says that we look at the present through a rear view mirror and we march backwards into the future, um, which uh, means that we're usually constrained or blinded by the past when we think about the future. Um, and speculative thinking and design um, tries to disrupt that. Um, so uh, it is essentially the methodology where we are addressing um, changes that we're dealing with in our societies by today, by reasoning from the future and using artifacts um, that are embodiments of possible scenarios. Um, and that artifact in our case for resilience is storytelling. Um, so thank you for uh, being with us today and for uh, joining our movement of trying to prototype the future <laughs> um, collectively through storytelling. Um, Christy? Yeah, so uh, futures thinking just in general of like to, we are, trying to make future thinking something that people everywhere start to do because we really believe that that um, like this statistic here says that like if p people who think about the future more think more about long-term goals so if we can make more people start thinking about the future we can all start to build a better future for ourselves now as we talk about imagining the future we're not trying to predict exactly what's happening Futurists, any futurist who tells you that they know what the future is, is not a real futurist. We're looking at a breadth of what's possible. So if this is where we are right now in our present reality, as we look towards the future, we start to see what is, this is called the cone of future possibilities. So there's a wide range of what's possible as we, as we continue to grow out towards the future. Uh, and what resilience is doing is imagining just one version of a possible future. Um, and as we look towards the future, we have a lot to consider of like what trends are we seeing now and what, um, what, what this pandemic is doing to shift our reality. Uh, but we also have to look at, in order to look at what's moving forward, we also have to look at the present and our past. Yes. And with that, um uh, I want to remind you all to um, keep your thoughts uh, and questions and um, ideas um, with us in the chat. Uh, we, we would love to hear from you. Um, and as uh, Christy mentioned, as we do look the, to the future, it is important to acknowledge the past. And with that, I would like um, to start us off today with um, a land acknowledgement. Um, so as you know, I'm joining you from New York and I am currently on the ancestral homeland of Lenape Hoping, L sorry, Lenape Hoking. Um, 
And um, a land acknowledgement is a formal statement usually that recognizes and respects the indigenous people um, as traditional stewards of this land and um, the enduring relationship that exists between uh, indigenous people and their traditional territories. Um, and today our conversation is on, um, we're kicking off our celebrations for uh, Earth Day, which is uh, taking place on Wednesday um, uh, of this week. Uh, at Resilience, we believe every day is Earth Day. And, um, um, and uh, which is why we think the sand acknowledgement is very important. So I would like to acknowledge and pay my deep respect to the Lenape people, uh, elders and ancestors of the past, present and future. Uh, I acknowledge and I offer my deep gratitude to this Lenape land um, that supports us as we are gathered here right now together virtually. Uh, and I invite you to join me in that acknowledgement, that respect uh, and that gratitude. And I invite you to reflect on the land upon which you stand. I know many of you are joining us from various cities uh, around the world, from London to Amman to Turkey, to uh, Turkey, and um, uh, all of uh, our collective histories include um, colonialism. And so, um, with this land acknowledgement and and with our in our commitment um, as change makers in this project um, to truth and to justice, it is our responsibility to work towards reconciliation and to holding um, the power structures and systems in place accountable, including colonial systems. Um, this acknowledgement is a simple way of showing our respect and it's a step towards correcting the stories and the practices that erase indigenous people's history and culture and towards inviting and honoring the truth. And as we're celebrating Earth Day today, um, it's important to note that for more than 500 years, native communities across the Americas have demonstrated resilience and resistance in the face of violent efforts um, to separate them from their land, from their culture and from each other. Um, they remain at the forefront. They have always been and continue to be at the forefront of the movements um, that are uh, protecting the earth and the life that it sustains. And with that, I am uh, really excited to be introducing our panelists that are with us today. I will start off with Anita Rahman. Uh, Anita is a climate scientist. She is a sustainability consultant and environmental justice advocate. Her uh, prior clients and employers include the UN, uh, the New York Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, the State Department, US EPA, and Columbia University. Um, she most recently has been supporting the UN with environmental education and sustainable development initiatives globally. And um, Anita has been part of many of our creative thons and she kind of is our climate scientist in residence for a resilience project and has been part of our previous conversation. So, uh, and a fun fact about Anita, she um, in the 2013, 2013 UN climate conference was one of the youth um, that were advocating and went on a um, hunger strike to push for meaningful outcomes from the UN. Um, so we, uh, we're really grateful that she was with us today uh, as an, an activist uh, early on in the movement. And um, we also have Amir, who is an environmental futurist, Amir Jandali, um, and social designer, also based currently in, uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, we um, we met a few weeks ago through Art Plus People, and we're, we have so many things in common. And it was um, we're really happy that he um, has been uh, in conversation with us since. Uh, after earning a master's degree in design for social innovation from the School um, of Visual Arts (SVA), Ahmed founded Future Meets Present, a company uh, on a mission to bring a sustainable future to life through design. Um, some of Future Meets Present's projects include the bracelet. I hope I'm pronouncing it correct, Ahmed, am I? Okay, perfect. Um, uh, it's a first to market wearable tote bag designed to replace single use plastic bags. And he also hosts the Marketplace of the Future, which is a yearly event in New York that brings together 50 eco-conscious um, startups representing a snapshot of an eco-friendly future. And last but not least, um, uh, Bushra Batayne, who, fun fact, is also my double first cousin and sister. Um, <laughs> she's a hydrologist and currently um, works in infrastructure strategy, development, and investment. She completed her PhD in sustainable design and construction 
um, from Stanford University and also has a master's in hydrology from Stanford. She has also been advising uh, resilience from the very start on everything water and um, sustainability. And I am really honored to have you all join us today. I'm going to kick us off with our first question where I want to learn from you and you all have kind of different experiences. Um, so through the lens of your work, what is something that you hope will be part of our uh, future everyday lives in the year 2032? As Ahmed, as our in, uh, environmental futurist, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. Good off. Testing, testing. Yes, we can hear you. Very good. Okay. Uh, good morning. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Wherever you're coming from. Good evening, people across the world. One of the things I just have to say that I'm really loving about these Zoom calls mm -hmm. is that we're, there's people here from the past, present, and future all at the same time. And I think this is freaking sweet. <laughs> yes. Um, I want to also start off with a question, too. Um, I was thinking about this as you were preparing me to answer. Um, I'd love it if people could type into the chat what are some things that they're doing in their daily lives to try and reduce their impacts. Um, carrying your own bottle, composting, just little things like that. If people could just kind of sprinkle those in, I think it'll be good for us to uh, riff off of as this conversation goes. But so the question is, um, what do we hope becomes normal in 2032, right? Yes. It relates to my work, right? Like what's... Yes, I mean, what's something that you hope is going to be part of your future everyday life in the year 2032? Yes, through your work. And I know you do a lot of envisioning of what is what sustainable futures could look like. Yeah. Just to, um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Noor's right. So I'm constantly thinking about what the future needs to look like, not only just what it can look like, but what it needs to look like. And, and I'm sitting here in my apartment in Brooklyn and I'm looking at my window and I'm seeing these super cool Brooklyn style brick apartment buildings. And I see in the future, I see them just covered with plants. Um, there's just this natural snapshot that we all tend to imagine about solar panels on rooftops, uh, rooftop gardens, renewable energy everywhere, all this, this really big picture stuff. And I think this is usually where I default to is thinking about that snapshot. But as I was thinking about this panel over the past few days, uh, something else occurred to me too. Like, you know, I, I spent a few hours the other day just sitting down writing my journal and I went, I started taking, I took a shower. And as I was in the shower, I was thinking about how much water I'm using in the shower right now. And I don't have that information. Like it's hidden from me. I'm not, you know, I don't know how often we get out of the shower knowing how much water we just use. Well, Anita, you might. Um, but one of the things to answer your questions, one of the things that I think about is that moment of concern for me, that moment of stress, that moment of, am I being a responsible person right now? I think we're going to start seeing these moments of stress in the year 2032 redesigned to where I'm in a home and I'm washing my hair and I'm in the shower using water that was already passed through a gray water filtration system. I think all of these little things that we're experiencing in our lives that are these little pain points will be redesigned in the future. Things like if you're concerned about how much water you're using, things like skepticism that we have about if recycling is actually working or not. Skepticism is so high about these things. I see in 2032, all of that being normalized and solutions just being integrated into our lives. And like, I'm looking over here, like Tiffany also eating a plant-based diet. I mean, that's, that's perfect. Like how many people have tried the Beyond Meat Burger? I freaking love that thing. It's delicious. And I mean, I know it might have its controversy, you know, whatever, but I'm trying to also lead a plant-based diet too, but every once in a while I want a freaking burger and it's delicious. So I think solutions like this will be normalized in the future. Okay. Anita or Bushra, would, who would like um, to add to that or challenge it? <laughs> sure. uh, I'll go ahead. Um, no, I agree with everything that, uh, that you just said. And it's really hard for me to think about 2032 now without taking into account what's going on today, especially in the last three months. And 
I've been th I've been hearing a lot of uh, conversations about you know how can we apply some of these things that are happening with coronavirus to climate change, or you know how are things going to be changed? You know we're we're seeing all of these really positive benefits of you know air pollution is going down, and in New York City carbon monoxide has gone down fifty percent. We're seeing all these things happening glo globally, and uh, and now we're in a you know a type of economic downturn and recession and all of these things have kind of been playing into my thinking about how we're gonna how 2032 is gonna be and how it's, what's it gonna look like and so I've been so before this conversation I started to do some research on you know what was it like 12 years ago actually you know it's gonna be 12 years now what what were we doing and um, Facebook had just started uh, Netflix was still mailing uh, DVDs to everyone. Um, it wasn't streaming yet. Um, we were still using Blackberries. MySpace was still a thing, um, even though Facebook had just come out. Um, and, and then there was a huge economic recession. And out of that actually came a lot of really interesting innovations. Um, and that's happened during any economic downturn, like Disney and General Electric, all those things um, came out of recessions. And what came out of 20, 2008 was um, a democratizing of services. So now we can be, we can be cab drivers because we have Uber. Um, we can be hotels because of Airbnb. We can crowdsource our ideas with Kickstarter. Um, we can be our own reporters because we have our own, we have phones that connect to everything. And I think, uh, and I think as we get towards 2032, we're going to see some of these things happening in, in other areas too that are for example, some of these areas that are being bailed out. I think online, I think education is gonna be democratized to some degree um, with more online education. I think medicine is gonna be democratized with like more telehealth. Um, and so I think these are gonna have secondary environmental benefits um, with, because we're gonna think differently about physical space. Uh, you know, we're not gonna wanna go into crowded buildings anymore. We're not gonna necessarily wanna go to airports as much anymore. Um, it's gonna affect business travel. So, you know, if we can just do the same kind of work from home, then why do we need to go to commercial buildings? Um, and I think it's gonna also have effects on small businesses. Like they're also being bailed out right now. Why do you need to have a physical restaurant when you can just rent out a kitchen and then do delivery and takeout? Um, we're going to maybe we'll see like a WeWork model with other types of services and it's going to be, be even more of a sharing economy. So I think, I think when I think about 2032, I think about transportation emissions going down significantly because of how we think of physical space nice. and maybe even building emissions going down significantly because of that. And maybe these commercial buildings also turning into more residential spaces. Um, you know, instead of, you know, we don't, maybe we don't need a huge big Bank of America building. We can just have like, we can just have residential space instead. Um, so that's, those are some of the things I've, I've been thinking about. Vishra, what do you think? Um, I mean, I think when I think about the future through the lens of, of water, I think about sort of current times when we have kind of come collectively together to address a common challenge and how I'm hopeful that we could do so similarly to approach uh, the issue of water scarcity and climate change. Uh, my mm -hmm. concern is that the speed by which that problem is growing and manifesting itself is slower paced, but I hope that we can still approach it with um, similar seriousness and concern to, to address that issue. Um, I also hope that when I think about the year 2032, that we have either met or made significant progress towards the sustainable development goal number six of um, having universal water access and, and access to clean uh, water and, and to sanitation, um, where currently 800 million people do not have access to, to clean water. I, um, I'm hopeful that, that we can do so um, by kind of being uh, proactive in, in, in three ways. Um, the first being that we need to invest in our water infrastructure. I mean, estimates to reach the sustainable, the sustainable development goal of uh, water access is estimated at 1.7 trillion between now and 2030, so for the next 10 years. And that's at least triple the current investment levels. Um, and, and we really need to, to, to do so. Um, 
to kind of move towards that future versus a more dystopian one. Um, the second would be to, to innovate. Um, we need to expand um, our treatment capacities in recycling our wastewater much more so than we do now. Um, to expand our water supply through desalination if it's available to certain countries, um, to leverage renewables to treat our water as well. Um, there's promising technologies in solar power desalination, for example, um, and improving the efficiencies in our existing system. So in a lot of places, our infrastructure, water infrastructure is aging significantly. So um, the pipes under the ground um, in many cities are 50, 60, 70 years old. Um, water leakage um, or non-revenue water, as, as we refer to it sometimes, is um, so the, the number of water, the percentage of water that's leaked from when it leaves the treatment plant to when it reaches the end user. Um, in London, for example, it's about 25%. Um, in parts of California, it's 30%, similar for New York. Um, in parts of Jordan, it's 50%. And so we need to, um, we need to address those. Um, and then the last is to, is to diversify our water portfolio, I would say. So um, of our, the globe, so everyone's like, well, the earth is mostly water, isn't it? Yes, uh, but a lot of it is saline. And so um, the portion of water that's actually fresh is only 3%. And of that, the majority is frozen. So about 70% is in ice caps and glaciers, 30% um, is underground and we tend to be over-reliant on groundwater when we need to think about it more as our savings account. Um, and so if we diversify our resources, uh, our water resources that we draw from and become less reliant on groundwater, um, I think that with those we can help um, achieve the water future that I try to envision um, from a positive lens. And so um, invest, innovate, and diversify. Wow. So such important points. Thank you so much uh, for sharing all that um, really valuable knowledge, but also for pointing out the many disparities that exist within the systems right in place. Uh, and if anything, this current pandemic has exposed so many of the faulty structures in place. Um, uh, perhaps for the best, I guess, on that note. I know that there are so many questions that are coming in and I'm so grateful for them and so many important notes that I'm trying to keep up with on the chat. Um, but uh, to, uh, to unpack a little bit what uh, Bushra uh, touched on, um, not to take it to this topic, <laughs> but will the wars of the future be over water? Um, and um, yeah. Uh, I, could, I could try to, to address that one. Um, I think that if we don't take uh, certain actions, then yes. Um, I feel that we've already seen sort of signs of, of water-driven conflict. Um, uh, I fear that the number of pe the two billion people living in water-stressed regions, for example, that haven't um, developed kind of the resiliency in their water systems um, and then therefore become reliant on external um, sources of water, be it a neighboring, you know, nation with which they share a um, river basin, for example. Um, and so, I, I fear, I fear that that um, is only going to get worse. And if we don't have um, enough of a cushion in our water supply, then with climate change, and you know, we know that there are going going to be more extreme. Uh, weather events. Now, overall, precipitation is going to increase, but we're going to have much more drought um, and disparity in the distribution. And so um, that, I fear, is going to cause additional instability. Uh, displacement is a huge one I worry about, where, you know, currently we have the largest displacement of humans in our history at 70 million. Um, but when we look at water scarcity through 2030 under current uh, climate scenarios, water-driven displacement could reach 700 million. So that's a tenfold increase in displacement driven by water. And, and I think that in a dystopian future, I, I am extremely concerned about. So we'll have more climate refugees, water refugees. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and so, you know, we'll see more day zeros, if you've heard of those, where cities approach kind of day zero, where you're 
essentially running out of water. You may have seen this a few years back with Cape Town in South Africa, yeah. uh, Chennai in India more recently. Um, even Jordan was kind of, you know, is, is on its path to that if we don't invest in desalination and other um, measures. And so I, I worry that if we don't take the steps that I had tr tried to um, cover previously with sort of investing, innovating and diversifying the portfolio, countries will be uh, in a compromised position um, and we might see additional conflict and potentially a World War III over water. I mean, people don't realize that the Syrian refugee crisis was also very much tied to water and to drought. Oh, yeah. but, but I, I, have, I feel like you want to share something. You unmuted yourself earlier. Is there something you wanted to, <laughs> to add? No, I mean, both of you, please. Oh, I was going to say, um, I think what this pandemic has, and also South, uh, South Africa, actually, maybe you can comment on this too. What it's indicated to me is that we can respond in a crisis if we really want to. Um, and what I, what I know about South Africa and their day zero is that it never happened, actually, because people were aware that they were going to reach a day zero, so they started conserving water so much that they never reached the point where they actually ran out. Um, and so it, it really does indicate that if we are, if we really feel like there is a crisis and it's, and all of our, you know, government officials make it clear to us that this is a crisis and we need to do something now, um, we have the ability to act. Uh, we have the capacity to do so. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, with the transition, you know, transitions of government with younger people getting older and running for office, that we're going to have more of that kind of pressure. Um, and more of that message, the same message um, being said across government. Yes. Um, okay. So before we take any questions from the audience, <laughs> um, from the people that are with us today, I, I do want to unpack um, one thing that was um, mentioned a lot last week um, in our conversation about disinformation. There uh, was a study that showed that more than 60% of um, tweets on climate change on Twitter were from bots and a lot of them were climate denied messages. Um, in a climate, in a post-truth environment that we are currently living in where um, uh, we are dealing with um, uh, not just climate denial movements, but also um, f money and federal uh, decisions that are made on a federal level that are uh, unpacking um, and taking us back after years of progress. On, and especially with the climate, um, the Paris Climate Agreement that I know you worked on, Anita, specifically. Um, what does that mean for our future? Uh, and, and especially in light of the current pandemic, um, what does that mean for for our in, for our roles as individuals as well in in addressing these systemic issues? Sorry, that was a big question. <laughs> question. So I wanted to refer to. Um, no, when you say that, do you mean bots and misinformation about climate? Well, bots and misinformation being one. Um, and the spread and the climate denial movement, um, but also um, the fact that we are dealing with uh, sets as well as I guess um, policy, because um, the the Paris Climate Agreement advanced some of the decisions and the Sustainable Development Goals, specifically the ones um, relating to climate change. Um, and as we know, the current administration pulled the, this country out of the Paris Climate Agreement, which means um, that it's, uh, a lot of the progress that's been made is currently on hold, if not being reversed. So in light of disinformation and in light of policy change, um, what is our role as individuals in advancing um, these really important issues? That's, is that a, that's, a really, that's a good question. Wow. Whew. Um, And Ahmed Bushra? It's more of misinformation about climate change. 
Yeah, do you want to go? Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, Okay. Well, as, far as, as far as misinformation, and if we are paralleling it with the pandemic, there's a lot of misinformation right now about the pandemic, um, about how it's, uh, you know, it's bioterrorism. And then there are people who are completely aware that it exists, but are still trying to reopen the economy anyway. Um, and so they are spreading misinformation for other reasons. Uh, and so I don't, you know, I think that's going to continue to happen. It's just more challenging with climate change because you can't make that direct connection for people. It's just not as obvious. And it's, and it's much more long term. Um, and, and then with respect to leaving the Paris Climate Agreement, I think that was more symbolic than anything to say that the US does not want to cooperate with other countries. Um, what was what's really been uh, detrimental to the United States is all of, is changing all these environmental regulations is pulling out of you know almost 100 environmental regulations and even doing it now like there's been a change in mercury regulation even this week um, so I think that's been the worst of, of anything that's happened um, there okay and then your last the last part of the question was what can we do as individuals you can come back to me on that. <laughs> well, I think, Anita, I think she made a pretty good point like a paragraph ago uh, in her response to, and there's something that I started thinking about really earlier on um, in the pandemic. I guess, you know, since the middle of April now, I guess back in March is when it really started hitting home here in New York anyway. Um, and I think especially if the people in this group, by virtue of the fact that you're all here, I think we've all always sense that there's some sort of like something's got to give even before the pandemic happened. I think we've always felt that just in all of our respective lanes, whether it's water or policy or uh, human rights, it's just all of these systems are broken. We've always felt it. We've sensed it. And we've always in, in our spidey senses have known that something has got to give. And now those cracks are revealing themselves. And I think as it relates to climate, it's been a struggle for us to try and communicate how our daily impacts, uh, how our daily activities impact climate change. But what I think this pandemic has done is it's created that missing piece of our mental cognitive puzzle. It's like right as soon as the pandemic started becoming a thing, we all heard about flattening the curve. I remember the first time I saw that chart, I, like I didn't really hear much more news about it other than someone's Instagram post. And I was like, Something about this feels important. Like I, this communicates very well. I, I don't see a lot of negative memes, jokes happening about this because it just rings true. And, and so we're now unified in this idea of understanding how we are inputs on a system and how our inputs are overwhelming a system. In this case, it's the healthcare system. We get that, I get it. I'm staying home because I'm gonna be that one match that's not lighting the rest of the matches and I'm not going to, I'm gonna reduce my impact overload on this system. I think this is an incredible blessing for furthering the other conversations of how we're in, inputs in other systems too, specifically the ecological system. And I think what happens in these cases, when we become so sensitive to the issues, we're so much more receptive to the solutions. Mm. And in our respective circles of community, there's always that person that's a champion of one cause. In my co-working space or in all of my friend groups, um, everyone talks to me, they're just like, dude, I'm so sorry, I got a plastic bag. And I'm like, yo, no, that's like, don't worry about it, you know? My dad, my parents were on here at one point. I remember my dad was saying, um, we're from New Mexico. And uh, well, anyway, we, he was staying at a hotel back in New Mexico and then I went to visit him and he opens his closet door and he goes, look, and all these water bottles fall out. So like he's showing me that he saved them so that he could recycle them. You know, and I was like, yo, I was about to cry. It was just so cool. So I think there's always that one node in every friend group that is delivering some sort of a message. And now after this, we're all going to be hypersensitive to what those messages are. Yeah. And yeah, those the actions good. that we need to take will reveal themselves too. Hmm. Yeah, agreed. Busha? Yeah. Uh, well, that was really good. I like how you describe that as nodes. 
Go ahead, Brenda. Yeah. On on the on the notes thing, I'm I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of sort of individual action and how how that can ripple. Your story about the water bottles, I'm not gonna lie, is very stressful for me because I'm very against. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, 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 no. so me for too. me, I heard it differently. Yes, no, no, me too. 100%, 100%, 100%. I'm but uh, on that note, I I feel like there there's a lot that that we can do as individuals to to be more informed but also change our, our behavior however minuscule it is be it um, recycle water bottles not uh, use water bottles to begin with right um, one 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 uh, i think interesting fact about uh, about bottled water on a small tangent um, is that it's regulated as um as a food product under the the fda in the u.s so the the requirements uh, imposed on bottled water versus your tap water are actually lower than the the water quality restrictions on on your actual um, tap water supply. Now, of course, there are some issues with uh, water infrastructure across cities. Um, however, uh, try to avoid tap water. Uh, try to avoid bottled water if you can, and especially if you're in a place where where your tap water is of high quality. San Francisco is one uh, very good example of that. Um, I would also just say on, on individual action, um, I'm a big fan of, of kind of trying to keep track of one's water footprint, carbon footprint. There's interesting calculators online that you could use if, if you're, you're interested. Um, the one that I think I, I usually use is called um, watercalculator.org if you want to check it out. It's a little bit US centric. We need a good international one still. Um, uh, I think being aware of our, our, the water intensity of our diets. So globally, 70% of our water goes into agriculture, and a lot of that is actually wasted as well before it reaches the consumer. So um, being aware about, um, about where our water is going, the issues around that, but also our choices as consumers. So for example, um, a, a one, one burger is, is about 2,000 liters of water. Uh, to 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 produce that burger, so like a liter bottle, two thousand of those. Um, chocolate, I'm afraid to say, is also very water intensive. Um, so a um, hundred gram bar is about a thousand seven hundred liters of water. It depends where it's grown, etc. There's a lot of factors, but some things to keep in mind. Coffee is one of the most water intensive um, as well. So uh, every cup of coffee is about one hundred and forty liters of water. Um, so being mindful of those things um, and trying to take little actions to reduce our water footprint and also being aware of some of the broader dynamics and needs um, to, to um, be better stewards of, of our shared uh, water resource. Mm. So I'm seeing a lot in the chat about uh, like individual versus government and sort of circular systems and all these things. So I want to, this is a sort of conglomerate of what I'm seeing in the chat, not a specific question, but can we talk about how capitalism and our infrastructure systems of regulation on these kinds of things relates to the overall problem as opposed to individual consumption and how can we be looking at this from a policy level in addition to an individual level and like what's how much of this is individual impact versus like needing to to get to the systematic uh, infrastructure things? I actually want to uh, respond to Jamie and Michelle's sure. point about uh, mass education and activation. Yeah, and I think that especially and also um, related to Amir's point about um, about flattening the curve which is that I think this pandemic has really revealed uh, the importance of science literacy in our lives and and that we need better science education but i'm also seeing some really amazing modeling coming out of like the new york times for example like some of these really interesting interactive models or um some of them are actually augmented reality models where you can use your phone to see what air pollution is like where you live versus where it is in new delhi um and i think that well, I'm hoping that this is going to introduce more faith in science, but also help people really understand what modeling is. It's like if you take an action now, then you can you can flatten the curve faster versus if you take this action later, then you'll flatten the curve later. Um, and I've, I've been trying to use this kind of terminology in the environmental field. 
know, like flattening the carbon emissions curve, because people can kind of understand what that means now. It means that you're trying to decrease your emissions enough so that you're not, so that they become, uh, you're, you're outputting as much, so that you're not increasing anymore, and then finally you're decreasing. Flattening means that you're, you're increasing, at a, or you're just at the same rate, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so, so I think I'm using that same kind of terminology, but I think people are starting to get it, and they're understanding the importance of science and the importance of having technocrats also um, advising our, our decisions. Mm. I want to I acknowledge that <clears throat> one important point that I see Lauren, Lauren Burrows, so good to see you, um, uh, mentioning that um, uh, in, when we, in, ref in reference to coffee and other products being exploitative, that also people are being exploited in the process. I think that's so important for us to recognize in that, like, and I was thinking especially as you were sharing about um, about the ways that we can take action, um, the fashion industry in itself, and I've been learning uh, more about the fashion industry recently, but it is also built on uh, exploitation of labor and goods. And uh, if you specifically trace the supply chain of goods and labor um, of the fashion industry, they map identically um, colonial roots. And so, um, and I think most other, I mean, I cannot confirm this. I can confirm it for the fashion industry um, that they map, uh, I, they map colonial roots, but it's just, it's uh, fascinating that so many of the structures that we operate within are, um, or as a, as a result of uh, colonial uh, structures that do not put, um, that put usually the man at the top of the food chain. And, um, and we are seeing with the global pandemic that these structures are, um, are failing us and will continue to fail us. And I, I saw in reference to something that was mentioned earlier about circularity or the circular economies, the concept of circularity is actually an indigenous concept. Um, and, um, uh, and I think that if we had designed circularity or if we've designed systems um, in a circular regenerative way, then we wouldn't have plastic today or we wouldn't have um, exploitation the way that we do. Um, so, and it's, it's funny to see circularity kind of become now a cool thing that's being mentioned where really it is an indigenous ancient concept. And when I say ind indigenous, I'm also referring to like Eastern, um, Eastern um, ancestral knowledge um, that I also come, I mean, I'm acknowledging my roots here, which I think is important in light of the land acknowledgement that we also did today. Um, and with that, I think we should open it to more <laughs> questions. That was my rant. Um, I've got a question from Michelle. This was earlier on. Without direct threat, threat or an identified en enemy, what is the next best way to get those who don't fully understand the science to understand the need to act and work towards a more sustainable future? Which I think is a great question because if we're, as we're seeing in the time of COVID of like we mentioned, we can respond to crisis. We can make major changes when we need to, but with particularly, I think with climate, we need to act before we're at that crisis point. So um, we talked about education, but what are some, some ways that we can activate people to, to be, activists and to be uh, change, making change. Yeah, who would like to take that? <laughs> Come on, guys. I need <laughs> uh, audio check. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's such a super good question too. Uh, and something I've been exploring over the past few years. Um, the, way, the way I'm coming to understand culture change uh, is sort of like, actually literally wrote this in a grant application, that it's kind of like an Oreo. Uh, <laughs> you have something on top pushing down, something on the bottom pushing up. Um, I'm a fan of bottom-up change, grassroots movements, um, being intentional with our choices. I'm also understanding the value of systems change. I can start you off with this. <laughs> Um, so this is the product that we referred to earlier. This is my bandana bracelet that also doubles up and turns into a shopping bag, yeah? So I'm calling it a bracelet tote. It's a magic trick. And it's made out of 100% recycled material, can hold 50 pounds, and this is fabric scraps. And then you just go like that. And then you can go commando whenever you like, right? 
so started working on this project and then inevitably people are like super excited or eventually you hear ah, how are you going to get everybody to wear that no one not everyone's going to carry one of those whatever um the yin to the yang of this project as it le at least as it relates to my work and then we can expand on that um i have this and then in my office my co-working space i'm designing a zero waste system for the office space our uh, recycling rate our waste diversion rate before we started the project was 40 percent and well when we were still going to the office, we were consistently hitting 70 to 80%. And these two principles in combination, I think are um, how we're gonna start seeing consumers' behavior change. Products are gonna be irresistible, and they're going to be designed in a way that just has social benefit built into it. Um, each product that you purchase is just gonna plant a tree. Everything's gonna be made out of upcycled materials. Waste is gonna be treated as a, as a resource. and then. For, and th those things are made for people that already get it, that choose to make those decisions or that want to buy that reusable bottle just because it looks more beautiful. And then for those that maybe aren't making those direct impacts or the, those direct choices, the systems around us that we build, it's like that bell curve, the law of diffusion of innovation, right? The innovators at the beginning, those, they get it. They're going to go out and they're going to buy it because they don't need convincing. Uh, but then the systems around us are going to change. Unfortunately, like my neighborhood in Brooklyn, we don't have composting yet. But when that becomes so much less of a burden, where you don't have to go so far out of your way to compost to do the right thing, the system adapts around you. Um, and these two energies at play uh, is what I'm seeing, especially now in the recession. Like we're seeing brands step forward and take a lot more of a personal tone of voice and how they're supporting with their business models. And I appreciate that so, so much. Yeah. Uh, how can we accelerate some of these systems being made? Because right now we live in a system where it's way easier to go to the grocery store and buy your thing that you can eat right now that happens to be put in plastic. And like you, in order to do a zero waste policy right now, it's frankly inconvenient. Yeah. Um, and we are seeing a change towards that, but I still would... I, I don't know statistics on this, but um, from my circle, I would say that like people are more inclined to prioritize convenience, uh, even though like mentally they want to be prioritizing sustainability. And uh, yeah, how can we accelerate systems that make sustainable choices more convenient for people? This is definitely where we start getting to the realm of policy, I believe. This is where the top-down effects matter more, more than anything else. Knowing as, as a ground up person, someone who's working in the entrepreneurial world, knowing that the Paris Climate Accord was reached in and of itself, knowing that tens of thousands of people have gone out in March, well, that's grass up too, um, grassroots too, but just knowing that these policies are being created gives me something to orient my work towards. Mm. Uh, I don't know if that's... Yeah, Anita, you both have a lot of experience in the policy world. Would you like to speak to that? Anita, you go first. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts that I was, um, hold on. Oh, first I was going to respond to individuals and how we can educate people. So I think part of it is uh, educating people when they're very young. And so the UN Environment Program is actually coming out with a really interesting new program next week, which is, uh, it's, a, it's like a homeschool platform for kids. Um, so that they can use this time while they're home during COVID to actually get an environmental education. Uh, and this is going to launch on Earth Day. And also YouTube also has like a really interesting new homeschooling platform that they just came out with also, which, you know, their discovery channel is connected to it and uh, National Geographic is connected to it. So there's like a ton more environmental content than has ever been out there before. Um, and so I think uh, the exposure that kids have and the availability that they have to this kind of content will really help, at least with the next generation, um, being much more environmentally conscious and environmentally aware. Um, and then also, you know, as we get older, because we, I know we are much more environmentally conscious than probably our parents were because they weren't really talking about climate change the same way we are. Um, and when our generation starts to get into politics and everyone here should, you know, consider going into politics too, um, th then we can start to see changes in government as well. Uh, and then as far as accelerating the change for, for businesses, I agree. I, it's definitely a policy type 
think, and I, I think carbon pricing is, I keep saying this, but I really believe carbon pricing is the way that we're going to be able to transition quicker uh, and force, you know, companies that are using dirty energies to account for those energies and reward companies essentially that are, you know, pro environment and, um, and the sooner that we are able to do that, I think the quicker we'll be able to transition. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think sort of along the lines of a carbon tax, we need price signals. I mean, we operate um, in that type of world. And so we need to have those price signals that essentially dictate for now a change in behavior. Um, because I don't think we were properly valuing the impacts of our activities on the planet. But I also, on the opposite side, I don't think we're properly valuing the potential positive impacts of improving a water system, for example, of capturing wastewater and recycling it or rainwater. I mean, sewers were designed, like the word sewer comes from sea word, like get the water to the sea as quickly as possible, for example. Like we need a shift in the way we think about resources because we fundamentally aren't pricing them properly. And so I think along the lines of Anita's point about carbon um, taxing, I think we need price signals to shift our mind about the value um, of, of pollution as well as the value of some of these like really vital resources. Yes. And, and maybe kind of along convenience, like you were saying, Christy, maybe it's not that we have to convince everyone that they have to do good things for the environment. Maybe it's that we need to convince people that, you know, it's more convenient for you to stay at home than to fly to another country for a meeting. And that's also has, you know, that has environmental benefits. So maybe the, the way that we should approach it is to talk about it, you know, in the convenience way um, when, it, when it comes to things that are actually helpful. Yeah. And at the, at the risk of going the controversial route, I also think that we need to be a lot more nuanced in our conversations about the solutions that that are um, that need to be implemented. So, for example, um, I don't think that the price of water reflects the actual price that it takes to treat, operate, maintain, deliver uh, water systems, and and unfortunately, it's totally an equity thing where uh, people who lack access have to rely on on private suppliers on tankers and spend huge chunks of their monthly income on water supply in emerging economies especially and so i think we just need to be like more comfortable with the fact that beyond kind of the basic human right access of water which is about say 50 liters per person per day beyond that we really need to be paying the cost uh, especially at the higher tiered usage where you're, you know, you're watering golf courses or you're having swimming pools or things like that. Like it's not equal to that first base consumption. So tiered pricing. I also think that we need to talk about leveraging the private sector in addressing some of these water issues if we are to meet the investment gap that we need to expand access. Um, and, and it's not always bad. Like, I feel like, you know, all of a sudden it's like water privatization ah, or something, you know, um, and it's not always the case. Sometimes bringing in the private sector to perhaps operate the system or improve the system or, or leverage a technology that detects leakage. Um, there are a lot of, of ju not just money, but expertise, et cetera, that we can leverage. Um, mm -hmm at least in the water sector. And, and we see, for example, there, there are cases, I, I did a lot of work on this in Latin America, where in Argentina, for example, private sector participation in water actually reduced child mortality by 8%. And in the poorest areas, it was 26% reduction mm -hmm. in child mortality by getting the private sector involved in operating uh, the, the, the drinking water system. So I think more nuance in these conversations about the solutions and what we might be open to and for and against. And of course, voting with our dollars and with elections, I think are, uh, are key things that, uh, that we need to- I actually have a question for Bushra. Okay. So, so you've described the amount of water, fresh water on the planet, but as you know, water is unequally distributed across the planet. So like, for example, like Canada has a lot more water than parts of the Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. So would you suggest that like, um, would you suggest more migration or, you know, flex weakening of borders or any type of like that kind of political change in order to make sure that enough 
I think we, I need to be stopped hearing you. I think you have a bad connection. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I oh, think, awesome. yeah. Okay, so, um, so that's a, that's a really interesting question. Thank you for asking it. Um, Wait, can you repeat? I didn't hear okay, so my question was, um, since water is, is unevenly distributed around the planet, fresh water, um, and there's more water in places like, say, Canada than in the Middle East and North Africa, would you suggest that con countries, you know, maybe weaken their borders? I don't like to say that term, but, you know, um, open their borders more to other people so that water can be more equally dis distributed and people have more access in that way. That was my question. Yeah. Um, so um, here are my thoughts. Uh, <laughs> people like to live in places where there isn't much water. <laughs> Los Angeles is a big example of that. Um, and, and, and that's a problem. Like we have cities where there isn't sufficient water supply and across the Middle East and North Africa, uh, which is the most water stressed region in the world, um, we have very much those issues. But I don't necessarily personally think that we need to move people around to match where water is although i do think that for planning into the future um trying to take into account um basins and the 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 supply of of surface water and groundwater would be would be um would be very helpful but i also think that there's uh, have you guys heard of virtual water so it's 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 beyond the physical sort of the water it's it's virtual water the water that goes into producing goods services food etc and so i think what we can do is is essentially do as anita suggested but with virtual water instead of with physical water so we need to grow crops that are uh, water intensive in areas that have a lot of water um, produce goods that are very water intensive um, and and materials etc um, we need to shift that around much more. I think, practically speaking, that might be more doable than the migration patterns one. But that's just my opinion, and and I uh, I'm totally open to to you know I, I acknowledge that there are other potential scenarios here for sure. I'll add another layer to that question that also came from Lauren about how does this rhetoric apply to millions in the global south who are entrenched in neo-colonial cycles of co-dependency. Um, survival or sustainability? Yeah, I was just looking at that question too. And I think if, if think what you're getting at, Lauren, is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you can feel free to unmute yourself, but this idea of like, we in these American societies are talking about sustainability and like, we have a luxury of consuming what we want and then worrying about these cycles versus in other places, people are just concerned about surviving and getting enough for their day. So I love this idea of like, what's the, the sort of abundance tax or the carbon tax, uh, carbon tax being on companies, but like if we're above that 50 gallons a day, or uh, I forget the number that you said, Busha. Um, yeah, survival versus sustainability. Anyone? Well, um, I, I still think that uh, we need to, developed countries need to contribute to the Green Climate Fund, which is a fund created um, under the Paris Climate Agreement, it was one of the reasons why it was it became an agreement. Uh, it was because it was that developed countries said, you know, they would give a certain X percent of money um, that would go towards adaptation in developing countries and small island developing states. And many countries have not fulfilled those commitments. And I think that's one of the biggest problems in terms of inequity is that the places that are suffering the most are the places that have not caused the problems. Yeah. Um, and so kind of going back to that, um, and that's one of those things where I think it's a, it's a leadership question, um, because it's the government that's decide that's deciding like how much money is being given to this fund. Um, so I think in that sense, that's, that's really, that's a really important way to help uh, people in the global South. Yeah. Is there a way to promote that accountability of like, if they're not fulfilling those commitments? So the Paris Climate Agreement is not legally binding. So as far as like an international way of holding them accountable, no, there's no, there's no way. Um, I mean, there are, there are ways that countries 
you know, particularly to be more accountable. And sometimes that's through, you know, trade regulations and those kinds of means um, that are outside of the UN. Um, so I think, I think it's just been so uh, out of the conversation for so long that I think a lot of people don't even realize that it's happened. Um, and it needs to be brought back to the forefront of conversations. Yeah. What about maybe, uh, like, is there ways that we can frame this that these countries who are not withholding those agreements can can feel like they're benefiting from, like, I don't, just psychologically, the need to be like, we need to come together as a globe. How can, is there a way to be framing that to motivate? Yeah, so, uh, so like the State Department, for example, they do a lot of bilateral cooperation with other countries, but they see it as a mutual exchange where they're both benefiting. So like before, it used to be that, you know, the United States would give a lot of technology to other countries to, in order to help them develop. But now they see it as, you know, we can gain a lot of knowledge from these places as well. So the cooperation can be mutually beneficial. And I think framing it in that way is, is a much better way to get financing. Another thing is the United States actually had an innovation, a global innovation in science and technology program in the Middle East and North Africa. And what it did was it, um, they were giving money to young people uh, in order for them to get mentoring experience and basically build on their innovative ideas. And of course, it's like very good for people in that area, but it's also very good for us because at the time, diplomatically, we wanted, to, we were trying to fight, you know, um, different types of like, we didn't want any of these young people to join like uh, extremist groups and that would have impacts on other places in the world and that kind of thing. So we, there's always some kind of policy agenda attached, but at the same time, if framing it as like a mutually beneficial thing um, is a way to help uh, give financing to other places. In, yeah, I want, I want to just very quickly add to that, that in terms of the like fashion industry example, um, there are a lot of donations that go to the global south um, of clothes, for example, and they tend to be extremely problematic because they're not um, sustainable materials. And when they do, they're also washing. Uh, it's kind of like um, uh, a washing of the cultures. And we are we are seeing a world where everyone is wearing jeans and t-shirts. And then in certain high-end brands, we're seeing like indigenous prints that are making a comeback and costs thousands of dollars. And that's kind of, um, I think, like when we talk about colonialism, uh, I know I'm talking about it a lot today, but I feel it's necessary. Um, um, I think that, um, I think sustainability is really a culture. And it's like when we, when we talk about whether like policy follows culture or culture follows policy, I'm, I think we're living in a moment right now where we might see that culture follows, that um, policy will follow culture. Um, and um, um, I mean, I think policy will follow culture. My fear is that policy following culture will be too late. Um, so, yep, yeah, and that is that is the dilemma. So, does anyone have any resources I can read about um, virtual water specifically, or discourses around shifting borders and water access? For sure, if you could. Um, put some in the chat. That would be awesome. And then we have another um, question um, uh, from my uncle. Many of you that even after COVID-19, the world will never go back to normal as we know it. The human bubble space will be larger. Mass transit will be less used. Uh, washing often will mean more use of water, to name a few. Do you see major changes in 2032 that address these issues, as well as tread lightly on water and carbon footprints? Um, who would like to take that? Uh, I love that. And I think that um, treading lightly on the planet and our resources is a um, main goal of mine. And, uh, and I think that's a really interesting perspective of um, emerging from this crisis. What are the implications for how life will change as we know it and, and how that impacts um, the resources on which we rely? Um, and it's, it's, I feel like it's hard to tell. Yes, hand washing needs to increase, like in general, um, sort of washing practices and, and, and less reliance on, on mass transit. But there's, there's also a huge disruption to the supply chain currently um, that's having sort of impacts that I don't think we can yet 
quantify on on our res on the resources in general. Um, and so I, I honestly am not sure, but I think but I think that that's a really valid um, point and, and an interesting perspective. What what do you guys think, Anita? And Am? I agree that I think. Yeah, go. Come here. Oh, who's going to say? Um. Okay. Uh. Sorry. So I agree. I don't think that things are going to go back to normal as we know it. I think the social distancing, the physical distancing, is going to be for as long as we live um, and how we treat physical space uh, and I think I think it could have impacts like I said on transit probably more business transit than on personal transit um, and I think everyone's just going to be thinking a little bit more about you know whenever they go out do I really need to do this or can I do it digitally um, and that's going to have like you know potential reductions on um, on emissions I also think perhaps, and this is just my hopeful thinking, maybe we'll have more of a uh, more, more of an interest and prioritize more parks and other open spaces where we can actually be physically separate but enjoy space, um, like open space, especially if we are working from home more, or if we're spending a lot more time, maybe we will have more of, uh, of an interest in urban spaces and that is that is a hope that I have and it can have and that would have a lot of other benefits as well and you know including reducing the temperature of a city if you have more um, if you just have more foliage uh, so those are some of the things and that also could have an impact on the water as well because if there's more vegetation it could mean that there's like less there's less water leaving the, the city um, so that's that's one of my hopes uh, one of the things that could happen after this yeah, I have uh, about nine tabs opened up here with just different articles about um, from the Atlantic to Fast Company to Politico talking about what trends are we going to start seeing. Um, and, and like I had mentioned earlier, I find myself really long term thinking, thinking about 50 years, 100 years, 200 years into the future. And then so zooming in on these next 10 um, has been a nice refresher. And I'm also relating back to what I sensed that I wanted to hear when the pandemic started. I wanted to trust in systems and I wanted to trust the government. I wanted true, honest information and communication about how something is working. I wanted this stuff. So even something as simple as when I walk into my apartment building and I see a sign that just says, hey, our gym is closed. These are uh, you know, to reduce contamination. These are best. Pra this is what you need to know. I love the idea of being, tr being able to trust the systems that I live in. Yeah. And I would hope that this experience has created the conditions for us to um, seek that out more and hold it in higher accountability. I want to see when we're past this pandemic, I want to see communication from our government saying, this is our city's carbon footprint. This is how much we're, emiss uh, it, we're emitting. It, I want to see it beautifully designed. I want to see data visualized in a way that's easy to understand. I want to see it broken down to an average household. We see it in our electric bills right now, but it's like freaking hidden and it just, it doesn't, it's not easily accessible. I want to see this information normalized. I want to see it cleared up and I want to understand, I want governments, I want us to be able to trust that governments tell us how they're reorienting to solve problems. Hmm. Cool. I think um, this is a good segue into like how uh, there's a, I'm going to read Gabriella's question, which is, as students specifically in college, what is something we can be looking to following, engaging, so we can come out as a future leader or change and change maker in the world? Um, and specifically for college students, but also for all of us, what can we be doing? What's our call to action for us to become the future leaders and change makers that are making these sorts of data visualizations, these carbon taxes, part of our reality? How can we? It's our call to action. Final statements before we go into our exercise. I think the fact that everyone is here, you know, in this forum on a Saturday says a lot about everyone in this group. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, these conversations help all of us. They help me too in my own, in my own work. Like this whole thing about flattening the carbon emissions curve came out of one of these conversations. And now I've pitched it to people at work and maybe, you know, maybe they'll use it. 
Um, so I think just like learning more questions actually, you know, considering all the different possibilities of what could happen and, and choosing our own future to the best of our ability um, is really important. So I think just staying engaged and, you know, continuing these conversations is important. I totally agree. And I think um, spending time to, to think about the future um, and even the, even, even the dystopian one for the purpose of sort of inoculating ourselves against that and actively taking steps to try and, and steer um, towards a, a, a future that is more positive. And I think conversations like these are um, exactly part of what's needed to, to actively do that and engage in that sort of, um, in, in that thinking. Mm. Um, what I have is twofold and, uh, Gabrielle and I are friends too, and we talk about this from time to time and I've had a lot of time to process how to respond to this question. Um, I think there are actions that can be taken in the external world and then actions that can be taken in the internal world. And in the external world, what I found, um, is, and I'm trying to kind of break down at least my own experience in actions that can be taken in three levels. The first is the low hanging fruit, which is obvious the BYO stuff, bringing your own bottle and cup and bag. I value these things as gateway drugs, if you will. <laughs> uh, the small wins that just keep you moving forward. Um, and then level two from that is to reevaluate the things that we touch every day. Clothing, secondhand clothing, cool. Can I be getting, getting my clothes from a better source? When I touch my light switch, Am I signed up for a renewable energy supplier? Um, is this meat that I'm eating? Like we, we kind of just rethinking the things that we touch on a day-to-day -day basis, finding an alternative that suits our needs better. And then level three is when levels one and two have been integrated into our lives and we kind of find that nice flow of habit. Level three is I think where those things start to come to life in our respective skills and strengths. If you are a designer, um, maybe you're starting to design communications in a way that supports other people approaching these solutions. If you're in education, I, we heard that earlier, maybe we start talking to kids differently. If you're in policy, maybe that's that. If you're in fashion, maybe you're encouraging your board members to only shift towards using upcycled materials. So I see that kind of building out in three levels. And then the actions that we can take on the internal world, I'm just going to post this link. Um, it's such a cool uh, section of this amazing book. Anita, I'm sure you've read this back and forth. Um, it's a book called The Future We Choose and the, created by the two designers, the architects of the Paris Climate Agreement. They post these uh, wonderful mindsets that one will, I suspect, naturally find their, themselves coming to as they move into a shifting paradigm. And hearing, seeing this language uh, has been very valuable to me it's given me something to work with, something that I felt abstract inside. When I see it in language, it lets me move forward in a way that's workable. Mm. Well, I love that. Um, I, as you were sharing, I was just thinking like in doing the research uh, around our story world and you know, a lot of people bring up sci-fi narratives and in looking at the future and whether they're utopic or dystopic, I realized that uh, apocalypse, the apocalypse uh, is, a Greek, is a Greek word. Which means? Revelation. Nice. An unveiling or unfolding of things not known and which could not be known apart from the unveiling. So, um, uh, and I think, <laughs> I love Lauren's reaction. And I yeah, think Lauren's smiling. Hell yeah, Lauren, get in there. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren is joining us from Canada, by the way. Um, she is an awesome activist uh, herself, and we're really glad that she's here. Um, but yeah, I, I just thought I'd leave you with that. Um, and um, to say thank you so much, uh, everybody, for being with us today and for our amazing panelists, for all the um, really cool insights and for all the conversation and the comments and the resources that were shared in the chat. Uh, we'll be sure to share them once we share this recording, but uh, you can also actually save the chat so that you have... Um, uh, all the readings with you. Uh, we host these 2032 conversations every Saturday. Please go to our website, uh, resilience2032.com and subscribe um, we, uh, for you, so that you can stay up to date and join our alternate reality experience. Uh, as Christy mentioned at the beginning, we've already gone live um, 
and start our story world. Um, so uh, stay tuned because there's much more content coming your way from us over the next few weeks. Um, we really thank you for being here. This is where we, uh, Ahmed, do you want to say something? No, I'm just feeling it. I'm feeling what you're saying. I'm into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I'm feeling so grateful for all of you. Honestly, this